Christy Lee, we're back. Well, I shouldn't say back. We're here because this is the first time we've done this. It is. <laughs> yeah, it totally do, is. <laughs> um, do you think you're going to be able to commit to like a monthly hour with me? Because I, I like we've been friends for over a year and I've had a hard time getting three over minutes a, year. a month. <laughs> over how many years have we been friends for? Well, it's like almost five years. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's hard to the years blend together and you get that as a podcaster or podcasting parent but regardless <laughs> over the five years i think on average i get three minutes a month from you uh, and now you're saying you could do an hour a month well i mean don't take offense but um other people only get three minutes too so <laughs> yeah. and it's I'm only a there. small number of people i don't have a huge amount of friends i'm one of those weirdos that likes that likes to have like a couple of friends and then a whole bunch of acquaintances and that's it Okay. So you spend all your time in your closet in the dark, oddly. I do, I do. <laughs> and that that's um that's a whole reason why I thought it would be a good idea to do a monthly stream because one of the things that I'm finding after the whole pandemic thing is that it's kind of hard to maintain friendships, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not seeing people incidentally anymore, like at the office or whatever. So I read something about like turning friend uh, like a friendship meeting into like a ritual so it so it's it's something that happens every certain period of time and i have a really good friend dallas and i have already been doing this with her we have like monthly adventure meetups okay that so are that are scheduled yeah okay so we sit we get like we're obviously we're flexible on the day but you know sometimes we'll do like virtual reality and other times we might like go see a live band or something. I mean, obviously, uh, when we're in lockdown, we met at the park and drank. <laughs> <laughs> it got arrested. <laughs> I Yeah, I said to her, listen, if any cops come up here, I'm just going to say, get out of my face. Like, I am allowed to have a drink in the park. Leave me alone with my, like, LCBO bag. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah, no, it, it's tough. I get it. And I, I think as a... Well, I don't know if this is even a unique thing for podcasters. It's probably like small business owners and stuff would be able to relate. But when you have like a project on the go that you're in charge of, there's always a hundred things you can do or and need to do. And I just find like what happens to me is like as soon as I get a free moment, rather than texting my friend or whatever, I'm often like my laptop's open. I'm editing. I'm e responding to an email that I should have responded to three days ago. And, you know, there's just it's a never ending hustle so I, I get the yeah. uh i get the advantage of scheduling things but i just um it seems like a an unnatural way to maintain a friendship to schedule like we, we for one with you and i uh if we're going to continue to be friends it needs to be scheduled it needs to be recorded and streamed on youtube and released <laughs> and then yeah. released on our premium feeds <laughs> i'll accept it but it is weird conditions Oh, dude, I'm really sorry. I didn't realize that you expected more of our friendship. Do you need like weekly check-ins? Uh, a text would be nice. Yeah, a text? Yeah. Oh, you know I'm terrible with text messages. Yeah, I I, I wait till you send me like a form letter through text. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we're good. Let's, it's let's, embarrassing. It is embarrassing. But I'm glad I've gotten that out of my system. I needed to say some of that stuff. I get it. Um, I get it. But no, I, th I think this will be good because with our shows, we have our, our own kind of topics that we cover and obsess about and get right into. But generally, we're looking at things that have happened in the past. And I think for both of us, it's very rare that we would take a, a current like story that's still unfolding and, you know, and dive into that. So this has been an, this idea of Canadian Gothic has been like an idea we've had for a while as a way to do not deep, but shallow dives into <laughs> current unfolding Canadian stories, which I don't think there's other podcasts that really cover Canadian crime in this way, as far as I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there is. I'm yeah. sure that there is. I, I just don't know who they are. But, you know, it, like everybody has their own style and their own like things that they're interested in. Right. So, mm -hmm. um the, yeah, and there, there I, is there is literally a podcast about everything, and as evidence yeah. to, of that, today on the uh -oh. news in Nova Scotia, uh, like you know, I'm sure this happens in Ontario as well. But whenever, um, like anyone 
even vaguely connected to Nova Scotia does something interesting, the local press will cover it with like, you know, Nova Scotia or ex Nova Scotia person or, you know, a, a plane crashes on the other side of the world. And one of the people on that plane visited Nova Scotia 10 years ago. That's how they like lead the coverage of the plane crash as an example. But today in the news was uh, someone who grew up uh, in Dartmouth, which is like a city next door to Halifax, uh, she had left this this area years ago, and I think she lives in England now. And her and her partner started a podcast that's about having sex, about like their sex life, but it's filmed or it's recorded while they're having sex. What? Oh <laughs> no! Please no! I haven't been able to listen. I, I I haven't tried to listen, but I just read the article. And uh, the first step, what it said in the article is they did their first episode and they recorded it right after they did it, but it didn't seem sincere and it didn't have the effect. So from then on, they started recording it while they were doing it. Uh, will uh, you listen? Why what, don't you yeah, listen to I, I do. I need to listen to this. What's it called? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> Should I just look for Halifax <laughs> Sex Podcast? Uh, let's, well, let me Google that. Oh, and Dart, see. Dart Ma- Dartmouth. Uh, Halifax Sex Podcast. I just want to see if that works. Halifax Sex Podcast. Uh, no, that didn't. That didn't work. Damn it! <laughs> it tried Doc Dartmouth. I um, got it. Got it. It was Dartmouth Sex Podcast. You yeah. said. <laughs> um, let me find it. Yeah. So anyway, you listen to that, and maybe next month. Although what they're doing is, yeah, why this Nova Scotia podcaster and her partner record themselves having sex. <laughs> Uh, porn cast. Oh, it's, it's literally called Lacey and Flynn Have Sex Podcast. Wow. Um, you listen to it. And when we I will, meet I next, will. next month, March 1st, I want to hear it from you. Okay. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do a review of the sex yeah, podcast. I think, yeah. And I think some of your kinky fans may enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. Especially <laughs> uh, the ones that, that are enjoying the manscaping ads and stuff. It's kind of on <laughs> brand for me to... Let's to talk about the sex podcast. Um, yeah, but it's a, but you know there's a it's true there's a podcast about everything and there's an ad about everything. Manscaped is a company that uh, it like oddly found a home on podcast ads and YouTube video ads. I'll watch uh, yeah. a lot of YouTube videos and they'll have Manscaped ads. So it's just yeah, they're thing. doing a big blitz um, at the moment and. It's exciting, um, but you know, like we discussed last time, um, there is some controversy around the whole Manscaped ads because the the copy that they sent me, you know, the speaking points that I write the ad from was full of like double entendres, like, you know, uh, make his jingle bits hair free and like, <laughs> Like <laughs> that doesn't it, seem like him. a double entendre. That's like yeah, a that's one. Yeah, that's a full on. That's a full entendre. <laughs> it's like that's just a sexual <laughs> statement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. They weren't really double entendres. Um, and like keep keep his like South Pole fresh and crap like that. Oh, that's like the Christmas themed ad. So you have those because your show is so serious. How do you, yeah. it's it's like the cliche where it's like you're in the middle of it and then the body was being put in a bag. Clip and at HelloFresh, like it, how do yeah. you, especially it's, with Manscaped, how do you avoid that? Well, my my Manscaped ad, I vastly like pared it down to what they asked. And I, I felt that it was pretty respectful, though I did say one cheeky thing, which was, um, you know, my my other half would kill me if I spoke about his balls on the podcast. <laughs> So that's literally all I said. Um, but like I got <laughs> I got a, a, a couple of like uh, complaints from pearl clutches. Pearl and, <laughs> and I want <laughs> that's also a double entendre in this case. That's true. <laughs> uh, well, they would I be mad it's, they, my husband would be mad if he knew I was emailing you about his pearls. Yeah, well she <laughs> what she actually said was she goes uh, hello, I am. She's a 66 year old woman who's listened mm. to CTC since the beginning. I love the podcast. However, lately I am quite put off by the ads that discuss the hairy balls of Christy Lee's husband. <laughs> 
Okay, I never discussed his balls, and mm-hmm. nor did I say that they were hairy. <laughs> so it's it's like she is putting words in my mouth. <laughs> she goes, "Really, your listeners deserve tasteful ads. Please respect your public, young and old. It's bad enough that we have to suffer through ads, and I understand the need, but please be discriminating." <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you show your husband that email? No, he, oh. uh, he he probably would kill me if if he knew like, the hairy, yeah. <laughs> you meant that, okay? He I thought might, that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he literally would. No, he wouldn't. Um, yeah, but I just said like uh, like I've gotten like far more people saying that they giggled, and early on in the podcast, um, I didn't think too much about about where the ad spots should go. Like I was told by whatever the sponsor or the agency was, you know, you have to have this ad spot after the first 15% and this one at the last 15% of the episode or whatever. Um, And one thing I noticed was like, uh, for example, during the Robert Picton episodes, you know, we were talking about the pig farm and, um, that all the disgustingness around that and i i had hello fresh ads where i talked about a pork recipe and um <laughs> and the pe- people happen to be listening to that episode while the pork like my ads are dynamically inserted so that a new episode goes into a new ad goes into an old episode and they're like oh it's a bit disconcerting to hear a pork ad after you're talking about all, all the remains found at the the pig palace and I was like oh no um and then yeah. the other day someone mentioned my Andrea Giesbrecht episode the woman who uh stored the remains of her infants in a storage locker and that they said that the ad break was on just after the police had recovered the remains and then they heard a hello fresh ad after that oh, okay yeah oh <sighs> and uh, I'm just like oh yeah so, but now, like for for at least a few a couple of years, I've paid really strong attention to where the ad breaks are because the reality is not all the things that I I'm promoting are going to be things where I can remain super serious and be in in the tone of the podcast. And I think people can, like they they know the context, you know. Mm. And I have special jingles before and after the ads. I do so the same. Like, yeah, I try. Mm. I try not to make sh- make an ad break directly after something, um, like you know, really awful. It's you know, I'll put one after, like, I don't know, the trial or something. You know, pe- yeah. things that where there's not awful details. It's it's hard. You know how hard it, it is, is hard. I try not to leave it on a cliffhanger because I don't want to yeah. seem like I'm like, and I also want to make it stand out so I don't trick them into listening to an ad. Yes. So with mine, I where my shows most often is interview based. I wait till someone like finishes a point, yeah. and my next question is like a different topic. So it's like almost like the end of a chapter. And I have yeah. uh, I do like a musical fade in with the ad break in the second in the center, and then the ad then the music fades out after the ad. And I think that's like the perfect balance. But this is uh this is coming across as like an ad for your not premium feed. I see Nancy in the chat says, All right, I have to check out her non Patreon episodes. She must be one of your patrons and, yeah, that's, and uh, doesn't yeah. get to hear you talk about Manscaped. Yeah, that's Nancy Murphy. I should probably yeah. just send her all the applicable ads um directly so she can listen. Yeah. Well you should definitely put the Manscaped ad on your premium feed. People want to hear you do that, I'm sure. Just because you're so serious. Uh, and on your show well I, w- I shouldn't say you're so serious. People who listen to your podcast probably think you're so right. serious. Um, right. But, and I, they do, they, they, uh, when they contact me, they're like, oh, you know, you seem so kind and Miss empathetic. Lee. They don't know I'm like a total, like, salty goofball. Drinking in the park. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like scheduled <laughs> drinking in the park dates. Hello, Miss Lee. I'm a, I'm a responsible parent, I promise. Yeah, I, I believe it. Well, let's get on with the, uh, the, t- the topic we have here. Our, our idea yeah. for this for the show or series or whatever we want to do a, a call it is just to kind of throughout the month, take note, a mental note of the more either interesting or notable or fascinating crime stories that play out in Canada. And this will be our chance to kind of share them with one another and share some thoughts on them. Uh, I picked out a few. You picked out a few. Uh, who who goes first? Who wants? To well, I I also I wanted to add it doesn't have to be just crime because sometimes yeah. it's kind of it's it's more like dark stories or like um, that type of thing. Because I don't know if uh, if 
all of these stories could yeah, be considered a crime, although... Uh, now that I look at it, well, I guess crime, some, some may not be a crime, but will likely inv- end up in the courts with civil mm-hmm. cases, yeah. um, especially one of the ones that one of the ones I have. Yeah. Um, you yeah. start. Okay, let's start. This, um, I'm not going to start with the, the more disturbing one to talk about because we'll need to build up to that because it involves a child. I want to start with the story in... And I know you followed this, and I think a lot of people did when the news broke. This is the story in Manitoba. Um, p- people are just calling it the border crossing deaths, which I didn't even know this was a thing. But people crossing into the United States from Canada in Manitoba. I I remember hearing <sighs> news of people coming in the other direction. Like I remember when Trump um, had announced when he was president of the U.S. and he had announced like crackdown on immigration and elite like people who weren't legally there or whatever and that led to all these people fleeing the united states into canada but apparently there's a human trafficking kind of network that's going in the opposite direction people coming to canada making their way to manitoba to cross the border which is like it's a brutal spot um this story i'm gonna as i tell it i'm gonna read a bit of a cbc article because i I, they really were the first that i found that were covering it and their reporting on it was great so the the headline of this article is man arrested after four people including a baby found frozen to death near the manitoba u.s border so um A Florida man has been charged with human smuggling after four people, one an infant, were found dead in a Manitoba field near the Canadian-U.S. border on Wednesday. Now they're quoting the uh, RCMP officer. Um, What I'm about to share is going to be very difficult for many people to hear. It's an absolute and heartbreaking tragedy. The bodies of a man and woman and baby were found together in one area, while the body of a teen boy was found only a few meters away. So now they go on to describe what happened. Just before 9.30 a.m. on Wednesday, members of the RCMP Integrated Border Enforcement Team were alerted that U.S. Customs and Border Protection Officers had apprehended a group that crossed into the U.S. from Canada near the town of Emerson. So again, on the U.S. side, border services capture these people. One of the adults in the group had baby items meant for an infant, but there was no infant with the group. So that's what alerted them to some, to the trouble. When they were caught on the American side, one of them had a backpack with what I read was it was medicine for a baby, diapers, and like baby toys. It was like a, a diaper bag, yeah. Yeah, that, exactly what it, what, what it sounds like. Um, a search was immediately launched on both sides of the border, and the bodies were found at about 1.30 p.m. on the Canadian side, about 10 kilometers east of Emerson, and about a dozen meters from the border. So they were right on the border. Um, I'm going to read a bit more here and then we'll get into it. So let's see. I'm going to flip now to a different article that was more recent. So now that we get the gist of it, this is a CTV article and this is kind of talks about they're searching for how this family that was found dead even ended up uh, where they were found dead. So let me jump into it again here. Investigators with Manitoba RCMP are in Toronto tracking tips and information related to an Indian migrant family who froze to death last month near the Canadian-U.S. border. RCMP say they're still trying to confirm the family's movements from Toronto to southern Manitoba. So they, they know they arrived in Toronto from there, somehow ended up in Manitoba. It is a family of four from an area, the state of Gujarat in western India. I've never heard of Gujarat, but I wouldn't know Western India from the other parts of India. But um, in essence, this this what this article goes on to say is that the family arrived somehow in Toronto. They don't know the story and they haven't been able to put it together yet. They end up in Manitoba to cross the border. The plan, according to the group that survived, is that someone would meet them on the American side, someone who was involved in this human trafficking ring. When they got to the border, the person didn't arrive on time as expected, which left this group of migrants in a field in the dark. The temperature was about minus 35. Oh. Uh, some areas, they said snow was up like up to an adult's waist. And at some point throughout the night, the group of people all got separated and broke up in the dark. Um, and the person who had the, the like what you described as the um, diaper bag, 
throughout he what they said is throughout the night someone asked them to hold the bag briefly and that was the people who you know got separated um and by the time like morning came and they they were so far away they weren't able to find this family until they got on the american side and i it seems like the when you read the article it almost makes it sound like they didn't tell the border services what was going on but i'm wondering if it's because they didn't speak english and weren't able to communicate what had happened because it took a few like a maybe a day or two it seems before like that story actually came out but it is horrific and it's a horrible could you imagine meeting your end freezing to death and then if you let let it play through your head what probably went on that night like that is horrible horrific like, what must this family have been going through to decide, right, we need to leave wherever we, the place that we're at and mm. pay for smugglers to get us in. And, like, at this time of year in Manitoba, yeah. like... Well, minus 35, I don't know how long, even if you were dressed, like, it with what we would call winter jackets and stuff. Yeah, because that's the other thing. They didn't have the proper winter clothes. And I I know how that feels because when we came to Canada in 2009, we had no idea what the proper winter clothes were too. And I I remember um, going, seeing my sister-in-law and she goes, oh, that's a fall coat. That's not a winter coat. And I was like, huh? And (laughs) and it's like they wouldn't have not, they would not have been wearing the proper stuff and like I, I did that episode on the Sas- Sas- Saskatoon freezing deaths. So I like found out a lot about hypothermia and mm. how people die under those conditions. And like, I, I know that there's a, there's a, a, like a, a phase of it where it progresses and they end up um, disoriented and, and like, they don't know where they are and hallucinating oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I just imagine being in that state with an infant. Yeah, like, yeah. It's a the family is a a thirty nine year old dad. The mom was thirty seven. There was an eleven year old daughter and a three year old son, um, which is just horrifying. And if you see a photo of them, three. they look like an ab like a, a regular well to do family that for whatever reason, like wherever they were living was so bad that they were willing to take the chance, I guess. But who knows what they agreed to and what they thought was what they were in for. But the idea of walking across the border in Manitoba in January, but again, they'd probably have no idea. I'm going to read another section of this article, which gets a bit into the the plot. So it says, um, they arrived in Toronto January 12th from India made their way to southern Manitoba with the plan to cross into the U.S. from there. A man on the U.S. side was arrested and charged with human smuggling. U.S. officials allege he is a part of an organized ring, and court documents say there is evidence he may be linked to three other boarding crossings since December. Um, The documents say Steve Shand of Deltona, Florida, was driving a van with two Indian nationals just south of the border on January 19th. The papers say five others from India were soon... uh, Oh, that just goes on to describe how they eventually located these people. One man in the group also said he had paid a large amount of money to get a fake student visa in Canada and was expecting a ride to a relative's home in Chicago after he crossed the border, court documents say. So it's like a complicated, evil human trafficking ring. And uh, it almost reminds me of... um, you know, like back like 500 years ago or something, someone would be living in like, you know, Italy and they would just be getting on a boat to come to Canada or the U.S. to start a new life. And on that boat ride, you know, people would die and people, babies would be born and people would get scurvy, but it was like worth it for them to take the chance. It's almost like that's that lifestyle and those kind of risks, they're still happening today. It's just, it's, yeah, it's nuts. Horrible. And like the fact that uh, the best case scenario for them the best outcome of this would be for them to make it to the U.S. safely and then what, they're just going to be undocumented immigrants for the the rest of their time. No, like with no health care, no social security, like what? But they've decided that that life is better than what they left behind and Mm. that the risk was worth it. 
just yeah. tragic. There was a, another article I read uh, when I was following this. It was, I don't remember what publication did it, but it was an interview with a, a man in the U.S. who's, it's like this older guy who owns a grocery store, like a mom pa kind of grocery store, convenience store kind of place. And he is from the, he immigrated from the same part of India that this family was from. So they interviewed him kind of about like his experiences immigrating and the people he knows from that part of India who, who came to the U.S. and he seemed to not be surprised that this kind of thing happened. And he uh, talked about how people from that part of the world are, are preyed upon by human smugglers and human traffickers. And, oh, it's just awful. And, and if you show up not knowing the language or the lifestyle, you also and, and kind of brought, brought in by the criminal element, you're so easily preyed upon. So even if like even when they get here, when they got there, it's not like, just like you said, it's not like they're going to show up and achieve the American dream or, or whatever they were sold on. But I mean, it, Americans can barely achieve the American dream <laughs> right now. So oh, hell yeah. Well, yeah, I so should say we. right now, the last 40, 50 years, it seems like that's kind of American dreams a myth. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's a, a dark story, but I think um, it, it, it shines a light on like a, a dark kind of topic that, Canada has a role in and people should know and you know the people who work border services that's an important job and uh, yeah it's, it's yeah, just brutal it's when you read that it's like man it's so I, dark it's like I, I wonder if if they the fan I can't always I always when I hear stories like this I can't help but like climb into their shoes mm -hmm. and and like I start imagining this poor family walking across these snow covered fields and minus 35 and I'm like did they all just kind of pass out or at the same time did did the parent discover a child was dead and have to deal with that like oh uh, just yeah like... well, that that last night or that one night would have there would have been a period of time that was and you, and you know what it's like as a parent and what you would do to protect your kid uh i've fortunately i've never had any experience where i ever had like anything bad happen where i felt like helpless other than one time my kid fell and hit his forehead off a wooden coffee table and for a brief moment i felt helpless and then he like stopped crying and was laughing as blood was just streaming down his face and <laughs> did i ever tell you that story no i'll just tell you quickly um i was in the shower just getting like ready for work or something and uh, my wife like opened the door to the bathroom and she's like jordan jordan uh, our youngest child hit his head and i like opened the shower curtain and i look and my wife is like holding him. She's covered in blood. His whole face is blood. He's like screaming. And I had no idea what happened. So I'm like jumping out of the shower to grab a towel. Like what happened? Like, what? And then like within like me getting out, he went from screaming and crying to just kind of like touching his face and looking at it and <gasps> laughing. And she was crying. And we eventually bring him to the hospital. And uh, here's another crappy thing that happened is he needed stitches because it was split right on his forehead um wow yeah it was brutal it and looked he's like laughing yeah he's laughing as it's just streaming down his face um and it was uh he needed stitches but what i didn't realize is that like your forehead like the skin the skin is kind of tight so stitches oh. i guess can be a problem so they did this With kind eyebrows of eyebrows and stuff it, well it was way up on his forehead but they they rather than stitch it they use like this piece of like tape so they like oh, kind yeah. of like taped it, um, which he, of course, ripped off like three days later and opened the whole wound again. Oh, it was just it was a nightmare. When you look at baby pictures of him for like a year straight, it's just like different sorts of bandages. Um, but anyway, oh, the that was little guy. that was my only moment of ever being like, oh, my kid. But my one was I've only had one, too. I, lo I lost him in Dollarama. Oh, of all places. <laughs> of all places. Yeah, he got. You know, he got away from me. He was he was only about four and he he got away from me and I watch him like a hawk because he is a runner and and not like, anymore. No, not anymore. He's a gamer. <laughs> he's almost ten now. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's a gamer now. Uh, but you know, when you take a kid like that to Dollarama, I mean, you have to prepare yourself for the mm -hmm. fact that he's going to see a shiny thing and run after it. But I, I actually lost him. He ran so fast, I lost him, and 
I ran to the front entrance and I'm like, my son is in this store somewhere. <laughs> and everyone stopped. And then eventually some guy's like, he's here. He's over in the corner. It was, oh my God, I nearly died. What was he doing in the corner? Do you remember? He was completely oblivious. He just, was just uh, just <laughs> looking at stuff, stuffing around. <laughs> that, oh man. But it's, uh, but with... This situation. Do you know the story of the Donner Party? Have you ever heard of that? It's a the Donner yeah. Party. This is an old story. Um, it was, I think it was when they were developing like California, and where when that first became a part of the United States, people were like going to California to like you know live the good life and the American dream and all this. This is like you know hundreds of years ago. But anyway, there's this group. Uh, the last name was Donner, so they called them the Donner Party. And they were going kind of to make this pass across the U.S. to get to California, but they did it kind of right at the end of the year. And they needed to do it really quick because winter would be coming as they were passing through mountains or something. So they found this route that someone convinced them to take that would save them a few weeks. So they have like horses and wagons and all this stuff and a bunch of food. But this route they decided to take, it was way like harder and tougher to get through than they planned. So they ended up getting caught up in the mountains when like the harshest part of winter came and they couldn't go any further. So they had to just like kind of chill camp. But um, what happened is they very quickly ended up uh, ran out of food and it got to the point where members of the crew were dying and the people who were living had no choice but to like eat the ones that had died kind of like the movie alive if you've seen that about the plane crash in the andes mountains oh it's a, it's just another story of that sort of thing but anyway um i read a book about the donner party and this whole situation and that was based on one of one of the survivors had kept a diary while it was all happening but anyway when i'm hearing this story it, ju- it just sounds like kind of yeah. like a few hours of what the donner party went through but Anyway, oh. dark stuff, and I don't know what the solution to something like this is, other than, you know, the no, the UN. You know, this is like a UN situation. Yeah, I mean, and and like, I don't want to get into the whole climate change conversation, but I, I hear there's going to be a lot of like climate refugees over the next, I don't know, at least decade or something. So. Really? Yeah, because certain, you know, certain parts of the earth are becoming uninhabitable. Mm -hmm. And um, what is there? There's some re... uh, Some re... uh, Yeah, anyway, I I shouldn't be talking about this because I don't have enough knowledge to speak on it. And it's also like a... Sadly, it's like a political conversation we're in all of a sudden. (laughs) Yeah, and as as we know, I I got some flack for uh, talking to for being anti-billionaire or anti-capitalist last time okay i mentioned covid once so i know how you feel (sighs) i know that can i just say i i love billionaires i think they're great elon Mm. musk great like jeff bezos great who else is there bill gates great they're just Mm. great yeah they just do a lot of great stuff oh so many great stuff (laughs) Um, (laughs) let's let's move on from them though from celebrating them why don't you uh you picked out a few stories why don't you tell me one that from the month of January that uh, captured your interest. Yeah, so I have, this is actually a story that I've been following since last October. Mm. And it, it, it's, I'm glad, I'm happy to have this kind of opportunity to talk about it because otherwise I, I probably wouldn't have. And I feel like it does deserve more um, publicity and awareness. So I'm talking about the the water crisis in Akalawit, which is the capital city of the territory of Nunavut. So it's mm. like northern Canada, Arctic Canada. Um, and this capital city has like 8,000 people, slightly less than 8,000 people. And like over half of them are Inuit. And in like in October, the residents started noticing that that the water smelt funny, you know, it, it had like a chemical smell to it. And then uh, they started experiencing some headaches and, and dizziness and they started chatting on Facebook about it. 
And then two days later, the, the city of Iqaluit, like tested and found that the le levels are normal. So they didn't do anything. And then like a week later, the, the city staff detected a smell of gas like near the water treatment plant or something. And and the like the city released a second statement saying that, that the water is still fine to drink. And then like a week later, the, the mayor announces on Twitter, residents please do not drink your water like this is it no more tap water like we're <laughs> shutting off the water and after that um like imagine being told that you can't use your tap water it's not just like you have to boil the water mm -hmm. that comes out of the tap it's, it's like, like you cut no water so and like when we think about this it's like we're like oh man what are we going to drink but it's like it affects so much more than that like what like cooking cooking safely and stuff you know like what um rinsing your vegetables and boiling rice and pasta and stuff and so what they ended up doing like so the the residents are like waiting for for the powers that be to like figure out what's going on with the water and the like city declares a state of emergency and hires like an engineering firm to like look into what's going on with the water but it turns out that it's the same issue as many like remote uh, cities like that have. It's like the water uh, treatment plants and the kind of pumping facilities are all in like terrible like condition, terrible mm. state of disrepair, need urgent repairs and like no government will prioritize it. And so this poor small little city is like left to like fend for themselves i guess so th now they're like shipping in bottled water they're like a, a bunch of residents started getting really upset about it and like buying their own big plastic jugs going down to the river filling up jugs and then <laughs> taking them back and boiling the water once they got home and what ended up happening was because like people because people didn't have enough water to cook like there was a food crisis and like a lot of people like weren't eating and had to go to like a, a community food center mm -hmm. and like all like all the water jugs were like completely sold out and then have ended up the water bottles have ended up like waste everywhere just plastic waste everywhere they're living in a dump without water yeah and and like uh, after a while there were no plastic jugs left and they had they were buying like um gasoline cans and taking those to the river oh, filling man. them with water uh, it's just and insane when did you say this start when was it that they they got the warning to not drink the water or use so that water? So that was mid October they got the warning that's mm -hmm. after almost 2 weeks um after the residents first noticed the smell but um anyway after it, the the water so at the time you know the media reported on this uh, a Kaluit water crisis and you know we know that indigenous communities have issues with with clean drinking water <laughs> um and this lasted for two months two months and in December, um, they announced, you know, they'd found kerosene and gasoline in the water and they had no idea where it had come from, huh. but they had investigated and found that there was like an old fuel tank buried next to the water treatment plant and mm. it started like seeping in or there was some kind of spill. Okay. Um, I, yeah. And, and they thought they got it, right? Everyone's mm. like, okay, well, so our water's back. Like in around the 20th of January, residents started smelling fuel again. Oh, shit. So like straight away, um, they shut down the water treatment plant and now all the water, they're using a bypass system um, where the water is being pumped from the lake and sent directly to taps. And at, there's some chlorine added, but because the water treatment plant is, is closed now, that the water is not treated so at least they're getting water through their taps but like now they have to boil it for at least a minute because it came straight from the lake uh, it's just like oh, just imagine that, that, imagine that happened in a city for like right? two days <laughs> it would be huge news but i think that the, here's the thing though when when this is happening this is not like unique it's happening at, at yeah. a lot of like remote especially remote indigenous you know uh, reservations or communities but yep. um 
so you you want it to be well known so people will do stuff about it but yeah. the but what happens is it's like it kind of like it's slowly become well known and a lot of people know about it but because i think because of that it's just like it's almost like it's accepted and you just hear about it every so often but nothing yeah. change it's almost like the volume is at like a two so there's just this hum yeah in the news media of just uh, where it, it should be if it happened in ottawa or you know wherever it'd be a 10 and people would freak out and fix it but it's just yeah. this this lo- this uh white noise that's always rumbling that it just i don't know what well actually i shouldn't say i don't know what the solution is the solution is the government needs to just fix that yeah, it finds well, some way to make that happen. It shouldn't take them two months to figure out that there was a, like a buried fuel oil tank leaking near their water supply. Like a, it, it's crazy. It's crazy. And I think that the, the water is still like seeping in. But the problem, yeah, it's it's like um, the local, the like federal uh, member of parliament for a Kalawit um, put in a formal request to the federal government for um, $180 million to fix mm-hmm. the treatment plant and like bring it all up to code. Because the other issue is that Akalawit has grown in population and the water treatment and the water pumping facility was like not producing enough water for the population as it was. Mm. And it was also in a severe state of disres- disrepair and the infrastructure is just terrible. And it, it's like, It's like because it's not a big city and it's not filled with, you know, important people or whatever, important people that the media pays attention to, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like people just don't really care and there's like no pressure being put on the government or anyone to step in. It's... Mm -hmm. And I know, like you said before, it's this is only one location. Like we we know this is going on in a lot of like remote communities. Mm -hmm. It's just like... And I, I don't know if um, like what causes this, but often when there's when there's an issue in a community or with a family or a person, if you can like harness the media and social media and become an advocate for yourself and get it out there and get the issue out there, you can make some noise. But if you live in like this remote community with sparse Internet and maybe they don't all speak the language that, you know, CBC generally reports in or whatever, it, it makes it hard even just to do that. But it's yeah, it's a big issue. And it's I don't know if this is what's going on there, but a lot of areas as they grow, there's like they sprawl rather than build up. And as they sprawl, it even puts further demand, further demand on like getting fresh water and dealing with the yeah. wastewater and all this. And I know in Halifax, where I am, there's if you're building a building or a house, you pay, you get like this kind of tax break if you're building it in a certain area, like where the majority of the the density is or whatever. And the, they're doing that as a way to encourage kind of to build up the already developed area rather than to create new subdivisions and sprawl. Like if you think of where you are, I've been to your house, you live in like a suburb of a suburb of a suburb where you drive through like 45,000 houses that kind of look the same, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Rather than like just making the buildings taller in downtown Toronto. But if you think of in your situation, how much like plumbing and wiring has to happen to get water to where you are. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. but luckily, there's so many people there paying taxes and all that. And, you know, it's, it happens if you are where you are and it's, it's just like 4,000 people or something. Um, yeah, it could be a challenge. Yeah, but. it's I, yeah, I th- just it boggles. It boggles my mind. Yeah, I, I think the um, like many issues um, that that indigenous face, I think people just need to. Um, amplify the message in whatever way they can and make something happen and that can apply with you know getting fresh water or the situation with missing and murdered indigenous women simply uh sharing the the message but what about uh or amplifying the message but what i find is with with that like where i cover missing people on my show a lot missing persons cases i often get you you should do um you know an episode about the the broader story of missing and murdered indigenous women uh i I often think like oh like that would take so long it would take so long but also i feel like why like i wouldn't be the one to do it i feel like there there needs to be 
someone with that background, like Connie Walker. Yeah. Yeah. Connie Walker had a great show, but now she's in the U.S. working for Gimlet. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But it needs to be someone like that. And then I would like have them on or or share it and get it out there. I just I feel like it's 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 an issue that's so specific to the to that like someone of that background that they should be the one telling it. You you know what I mean? I yeah, I do. And I've like grappled with that um myself a few times you know should i tell indigenous stories or should i let them tell it but um i listened to a really good episode of um canada land you know i love canada land i do and <laughs> every time we talk about an issue you cite canada land i know i, I listened to <laughs> i i've learned so much from canada land um but i listened to uh, like ryan mcmahon who is uh indigenous and he was chatting with somebody else who was also indigenous about indigenous stories and who should tell them and they actually talked about um uh they kind of put it like if you're talking directly to indigenous people about their experiences then um like we as kind of white people should step away from that but they need their message amplified Mm -hmm. so i feel like i'm not when I tell the, the, the indigenous stories, I'm not like interviewing them or disturbing them or whatever. I'm just going by what's already out there and amplifying that message. So, okay. cause it's like, it's like, if you said that, yeah, I'm not going to tell indigenous stories. You guys can, can just, you know, you guys are the best ones to tell that I need to stay out of it. It's like, we, that it's like we have a platform that we could use to amplify their message you know Mm -hmm. so it's if we're choosing to stay away from it then we're not doing it we're Mm -hmm. not helping them out we're not being like allies Mm -hmm. so but having said that it is a big freaking undertaking or would be to cover the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and and similar with the highway of tears kind of murders like a lot of people um suggest to me that i should cover that one and um i think it would be a big undertaking yeah i get that that's one of the more common requests i get for uh, like story ideas you should do something with the highway of tears or the you, you know that sort of thing and i'm just it's like i would love to but it's 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 its own huge story and if you were going to do it you would need to do it like respectfully and well researched yeah. and it would be a project like you, you know what i mean like it, it would yeah. be not the kind of thing yeah. you can you can put out and then two weeks yeah, later move my, on to the next Here's my episode uh, this week on that. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Um, that's a long term project, that's for sure. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on to. Uh, I want to tell you a story that I think isn't too far from from where you are. This. Oh one, yeah, only like five hours drive or something. So this is. Um, yeah, because you're. Ottawa to Toronto is, is it that long? Five hours? I was thinking you'd uh, be like two hours away. No, no. And in fact, I think it's longer because I'm on the west side of the greater Toronto area. Hmm. And so I'd have to cross through Toronto or something. It'd be a whole ordeal. Yeah, it's one that I'm not ready to do, especially right now when it's covered in honking truckers. Uh, Yeah, my, um, I have a family member in Ottawa who has a, uh, one and a half month old baby oh they live right downtown and he told me the baby hasn't slept for more than like 40 minutes in the last six days because and you know how hard it is to get a baby to sleep once the baby goes to sleep and they're honking kind of honking the truck horns like on a sort of rotation like every like 20 minutes or something or every half hour or whatever so he's just said it's just constant so they have um music playing really loud um, all the time to kind of help drown it out and put curtains on their windows and stuff to try to, anyway, let's not get into that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, let me tell you a, sto- uh, a story that yeah. this, I will say, is probably the most awful story I've heard in a long time. And, and it hit me hard because the day I read it, I was had just been out sledding uh, in oh. my backyard with my kids, like, you know, like literally an hour before I read the story. Um, so this is the story of a 11 year old girl, I believe. Yes. 11 year old girl in Ottawa. Um, she had just moved to Ottawa. I 
from Lebanon six months earlier. It was her first time ever tobogganing. And it was, I don't know this this actual area. It's called Mooney's Bay, which is a, a neighborhood in Ottawa. And there's a, a hill that is like kind of the most popular sledding spot. A really big hill. And the, the, the way I understand it is the hill kind of slopes in one direction, which is a safe way to go. But if you accidentally go kind of off the main kind of track that people sled on, you go towards an area that could be dangerous. There's trees and whatever. So this um, 11-year-old girl who had been in Ottawa for only six months, it was her first ever winter, her first ever time going sledding. Um, She ended up going down the wrong side of the hill. She was on a sled with, um, actually, I'm going to re- I'll read from an article again because I don't want to get any of these facts wrong. So her name is Jose Abby Assal. Um, moved to the nation's capital, Ottawa, with her parents and two older siblings from Lebanon six months earlier. Uh, and the article really makes it even more difficult. A few weeks earlier, the girl had danced outside after seeing her first snowfall. And now she was oh. going sledding for the first time. So around 2.50 p.m. in the afternoon, paramedics responded to a tobogganing accident at the Mooney's Bay Hill. Jose was transported by, by a pedi- to a pediatric hospital where she died from her injury. So here's where it explains it. According to the family, a cousin hopped on the front of a plastic toboggan. Jose's brother climbed on next, followed by Jose at the back, who was holding her brother around the waist. Halfway down the hill, and I've been there when this happened, the sled turned 180 degrees and continued with the group backwards on the grooved curve, hurtling towards a cluster of metal signposts. So there was a series of signs that metal posts that had uh, d- directions on how to deal with the garbage. Like I think there was garbage cans there, so it explained what where the recycle went or whatever. Um, Jose's mother told CBC her daughter's spine was severed in the impact with one of those posts. So this is, um, this article by CBC really gives some graphic details. Yeah. Um, I won't read much of it, but the article goes on to explain the daughter after hitting the pole, she was alive for a period of time and able to speak with the people that were there, um, about she she knew her legs were injured because her legs were numb and she was explaining to one of the people there that she was worried she'd be in a wheelchair she was asking people for help eventually i don't i don't know like if you crack your spine what would you die from would it it wouldn't be blood loss but she she died i believe before arriving no it's um they said it was severed spine yeah so i don't know if if that's um how different that is to cracked okay all right um that seems like i'm googling oh that seems like an awful i don't know why i'm googling this yeah uh interesting to note the posts were removed those metal signs the next day they brought a backhoe and removed the posts and put up a separate sign saying no sledding which people are um petitioning for the hill to reopen which i think is it's like give that some time yeah yeah that that is true i like i understand like I read a an article about uh, from a guy saying, you know, sure the city might have put a couple of little signs here and there saying "do not sled," but everyone knows this is like the sledding area. Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. is the the sledding hill. Yeah, every and- every community has one. You know, yeah. and it's like there may be signs, but it's like that's where everybody sleds. They said uh, I, in the uh, one of the articles I read a few the the day after this happened, they had like a bylaw enforcement person there to make sure no one was sledding. And it was something like 100 people showed up throughout the morning to sled that were turned away wow. like the next day. But so it's a busy spot. Um, yeah. Oh. Uh, I'm just at the, I'm skimming through the article as we're talking to see if it goes into more detail about her injuries. But um, since I've already said it, I'll, I'll read just this section. Um, immediately after hitting the post, Jose, who was injured, she's the 11 year old, told her brother she couldn't feel her legs. It told him, I don't want to continue my life paralyzed. And he hugged her and held her until the ambulance came. Um, Jose also asked her sister to help her. And her sister said, I can't help you. I can only kiss you. And kissed her, didn't no. kiss her sister. Like it's is heartbreaking. Um, it just this has to be the the idea of 
her coming, enjoying winter, going sledding. That is like such a. Um, I can see that happening. I, I had a we had ex- an exchange student when maybe like, I don't know, 25 years ago when I was in high school. And they were from a place called Turks and Caicos, which is like a tropical island or something. And I remember um, the first day it snowed when they were at my place. And they were like outside, like amazed by it. Like it was magic. Um, And I can just, then when I take that and project it instead into like an 11-year-old girl starting a new life, just like the stories we talked about earlier, coming from another place and... Man, uh, so for her, I feel horrible to lose your life in such a like a shocking, freaky way. But then for her family, like to go on, oh man, it's just brutal, eh? Yeah, well, I mean, like immigrant life is very, very freaking hard, and it was very hard. I, I will, we will always remember our first snowfall when we moved to to Canada. Oh yeah, you would have had that experience. I forgot. You're Yeah, from... and it was weird because it was actually it happened on the first day of my job. And um it's the only job I've ever had in Canada, and it was my first day and I went out I had because we we're in the middle of the driving test strike and we couldn't get our driver's license and we couldn't buy a car. I had to catch a 30-minute bus to the GO train station and then I had to catch like a 45-minute train into Toronto. That was my commute. <sighs> and I had to walk to the bus. And the first time I'm like walking to this bus stop in this like super high snow <laughs> and and I like Thomas took a photo of me outside our, our little um apartment and I'm standing in the snow and I don't have the right coat on I don't have the right shoes on but I've just got this big smile on my face because you know it was magical yeah and that when when you move to a new country it's so hard and it must be even harder for for people who come from like different cultures, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, so to have those, those like moments like that, it, it, it's like a big mood, like booster for you, you know, mm-hmm. and like six months, like after they moved, like they would have still been in the thick of it, you know, yeah. it's horrible. Uh, so you, when you had your first snowfall, like how long did it take before you're like, I I hate snow, I hate slush, I hate salt, I hate shoveling. Because that must have happened pretty quick, right? I think it only took, I, it actually took about three three winters wow. before I started, before the novelty started wearing off. Okay. And then I What was do like, you think oh. of it now? Oh, I hate it. <laughs> okay, good. We can agree <laughs> on that. I absolutely, I do not, I like one snowfall a year. But what yeah. I, I say is like, I wish it snowed when it, Instead of like freezing, I wish it snowed from, let's say, uh, between like zero and eight degrees or something. Because how great would it be if it was like eight degrees and snowing and you could go sledding with your, yeah. you know, short sleeve shirt on if you wanted to. And, and then you would land in the snow and it would be warm. Like it would be an amazing thing. Like fluffy <laughs> sand almost. Um, but no, we get. And Keep it's on not, dreaming. I mean, it's not even the snow that I hate. It's for me, it's the slush that's yeah. all full of salt and gross and then that freezes so it's just this crunchy crap and it sticks to your car and oh yeah i i hate it so much and i don't even have to shovel the driveway or anything but well, who does and that just like thomas okay and and just like walking the kids to school in the morning i'm just like oh come on yeah <laughs> it sucks yeah but um with uh, with sledding, that that is like one of the very few fun things to do with snow. I, I don't ski or anything or snowboard, yeah. but I will go sledding and with my kids, and I love it. But, it, but there is times that um, I kind of not had close calls, but I've been kind of worried. Like I my three year old actually, I have it on video, and luck nothing bad happened. But just last week, we had a pretty bad snowfall, and I was looking out my living room window. And my wife and my two kids were sledding in our front lawn. And she put my three-year-old on like, um, it's like a circle saucer made of plastic. And she pushed him down like this gradual hill. That we It's just a, a small hill, but he was flying. And he just missed like one tree, just missed another tree. And then he was like going towards the road. And I could see her yelling probably like, you know, roll off the thing. But the snowplow had like made a big wall of snow at the end. So instead of hitting the road, he just like slammed into that. 
but he wasn't God. he wasn't hurt or anything he got up like laughing and i was filming the whole thing on my phone so luckily it's a nice memory but um wow. like but sledding it's i think um you if you're on like especially if you're on a big fast hill you need to be aware of of what's there um yeah. and not so much the kids like it's the adults should put you know if there's poles or something even if it's a freak thing that people could go over the way they could they could just wrap it in you know something to prevent that but that said the city should have known people were sledding there and even if you have yes. signs if you have signs saying you know don't sled here that doesn't remove you of liability it's not like someone no you, yeah, and they it, had no one like enforcing it they just mm -hmm. put the signs up and expected that the people the people would stop coming like yeah, that's not how that works. No. Yeah, and oh. and yeah, it's uh, oh man, it's awful. Um, but awful. I feel horrible for their family and for their whole community. That like what should be a, a f fun place to go will forever have um a really dark story associated with it. Yeah, it's yeah. Um, and then I, I also think, like, I don't know how the, like, if it goes to court or whatever, if anyone gets sued, but the fact that the next day they came and removed those polls, is that not like a bit of an admission of, you know, yeah, these polls shouldn't be here? Yeah, I, I was listening uh, to a podcast about it. And apparently there's been some kind, like the city have put their foot down and, and, uh, and yeah, there's some dodginess around it. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, they they went and put a bunch of hay bales or something down there, okay. and yeah, there, there's something dodgy going on. I yeah, interesting. <laughs> um, well, let's move on yeah. before. Do you got anything else you want to tell us about? Yes, uh, ju just very quickly, and I I would have put this one to next time, but it's um, relevant to the episode that I just released earlier this week. Well, I didn't and listen yet. What what is the episode you just released? So I, I re it's an episode called The Murder of Liu Qian. And it's a she was a uh, Chinese exchange student who um, came from China, obviously, uh, to Toronto to study at York University. And um, so I kind of it was an episode about uh, kind of campus safety. She someone broke into her. Well, broken they didn't break in she they tricked her into letting her letting them into oh my god what is wrong with me see i, I only have an hour worth of energy and then i'm like I'm then it gets like interesting <laughs> <laughs> um see this is why i have a, a scripted show i i literally cannot tell my own stories verbally um <laughs> Anyway, so, some guy let like got into her room and while she was chatting with her ex-boyfriend on webcam, so the guy on the webcam saw everything, this guy like sexually assaulted and murdered her. And, Whoa, um, while yeah. the cam was running? Yeah, and oh, a lot man. of it happened off um, camera. So the guy, w like this poor guy in Beijing, like watching his ex-girlfriend on the webcam be attacked by some random guy who came to her door um but yeah it was a really and he'd be uh, completely defenseless there'd be nothing he was he, he yeah the poor guy had no idea what to do he like froze he had he, yeah he's like i don't know like where is she who does she know he he just like started messaging people randomly saying like she's she's in trouble and oh her poor yeah. like he told her family and they had no idea what to do anyway it was it was really horrendous but um one thing that i that i kind of you know, I always come across these rabbit holes and I wanted to talk about the one child policy in China. Do you know much about that? I, honestly, I know like the name of the policy yes. and, and, and I know that here's my you, you correct my mistakes. My understanding is like you can have one child like kind of like for free. And if you have a second, you have to pay like different taxes. Is that how it works? Kind of. And then if you have three, you got to pay way more taxes. So you kind of got to be wealthy to have multiple. Well, like no, that. no. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to give you the Coles notes. So like the Chinese population started to like totally boom after World War, one of the World Wars, World War Two. Yeah. And um, 
And it got so big, and you know, China is so big, got so big that the government started to worry that, oh my God, we're going to have so many people that we're going to go back into famine again, and mm -hmm. we don't want that. So they they started like encouraging people subtly to have less children, and that didn't work. And then they started like giving them incentives to only have one child, and that didn't really work. And then finally, in 1980, um, they introduced this one child policy, and. So what it is, is that like families can only have one child and like if that if you're a white family in China, you were able to have as many as you wanted. <laughs> I don't know why. Hmm. And uh, some other like special groups were allowed to have more than one under special circumstances, but most people were only allowed to have one child. And there were fines, like really hefty fines if you had a second child. And if you didn't pay the fine, then the child would be like unregistered and unable to access any of the social services. Wow. Um, so there was that, but there was also forced abortions, forced sterilizations. Um, there was also forced adoptions. And I'll like, I'll talk a bit more about that. There was like... Uh, people would murder the baby when they were born uh, or abandon them. And um, people were also threatened. If you have more than one child, you'll like lose your job. Wow. Um, it, it was terrible. I didn't know this. I just, it's like the propaganda. It was like, oh, all these Chinese people are so happy with their one child. I had no idea that all of this awful stuff was going on. But the big, um, it's caused massive issues because uh, in the, the Chinese culture, they have a preference for boys. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but boys continue the, the family name. They're higher earners. They can work in the fields. And, uh, you know, they're just valued much more highly. And also in that culture, you know, the kids look after the parents when they age. Mm -hmm. So having a boy, you know, more earning potential, better looking after the parents later on. So when it comes to these families who can only have one child, they're like, oh man, we've got to have a boy. Cause if we have a girl, we're not going to be taken care of later in life. And you know, it's boys are the best and they'll keep our family name going on. This is our only chance. So what ended up happening? All of the, it was like baby girls that were aborted, baby girls that were um, abandoned. That's why um, a lot of um, orphaned baby girls were sent over to the US and other countries like there's a lot of Chinese girls who were adopted but no boys because they kept the boys um it's crazy and so what how it's like um born out is it, it's kind of been a disaster so like the population did decrease but there's like way too many boys now and like there's a big issue with the fact that uh a whole bunch of men will not be able to find a wife so they're going to be unmarried and so we're gonna <laughs> it's so complicated well it's not complicated but it causes so many problems that it, are far-reaching it does mm -hmm. and like um you know un unmarried men you know they turn into they could turn into like incel types you know oh. like there's actually like uh, criminality could rise they'll be hopeless there's like depression and stuff you know if, if these men have no prospects of finding a wife I guess because there's too many of them and not enough girls it's like now the girls are in demand mm -hmm. but like I do know a podcast they may like though if they want to hear what is it oh, in Dartmouth there's this woman oh. in her <laughs> sorry that was good that was good I rate that <laughs> um but yeah, the other thing, the other main thing is that um, if you've got like a boomer population, right, who are, you've got two parents and then the next line down is just one, like everything is like an, a reverse pyramid where the one child is at the bottom and then they've got like parents and grandparents and like it, every, all the pressure is on them. Yeah, so to aunts, make uncles, brothers, sisters, cousins. There's none of that. Mm -hmm. And because these families only have one child, like the pressure that they put on that one child to be everything that they want them to be, you know, they have mm -hmm. to send them to the best schools. So they're chosen for the best jobs. And it's like, it's just like a, 
a bit of a disaster. I never thought of that aspect of it because it is a cultural thing there where the yeah. kids will look after the parents. We're in our yeah. culture, like in, like that's not a thing here. We, it's, no. it's just, it's different. I would love to be able to look after my parents, but I, hopefully they're not counting on it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but over there, like in that part of the world and in that culture, that's kind of the expectation. I, I have a good friend who is, he's Lebanese and. I think that's kind of a part of their culture as well, where often the kids will look after their parents. And he, um, just some of the things when he's telling me about his relationship with his parents, like some of the stuff he does would just, for me, would be really unusual, like paying rent or, you know, buying them a car and paying their car payments. Like that, that's like a thing in his culture that would be normal. For me, that would be completely, like that just not, it wouldn't, my mom would have to get a bus pass, basically. (laughs) You <laughs> asshole. <laughs> yeah, well, but but it's like I never thought of if the if that's kind of a cultural thing, in the and that's the expectation of the kid, and there's only one kid. Yeah, I, I guess now I can see maybe why that pressure would be so intense, because it's yeah. like it, it could your kid would in a way also be like a bit of an investment. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So they they funnel all their money into this one child because this is their only chance, right? And if the child passes away, they're not allowed to have another child. It's like their only child. Mm -hmm. And it it goes by a birth, uh, like you're allowed one birth per family. So they had a lot of women using like fertility drugs to try and have twins or triplets or whatever. It's nuts. But like, um, like once like the government realized, oh shit, like what we, like us forcing these people to only have one child has, has like, resulted in all these additional problems they're like shit we've got to put you've got to try and reverse this and so like in 2016 they changed the policy where now you can have two children but the problem was with all the propaganda and the messaging and and like the the generations of families pouring all of their income and investing in their children and putting the pressure um, they don't want to have a second child. Yeah, because it, it, it's just it would be kind of like weird and taboo. It's like when COVID ends, I, yeah. I, I'm going to feel weird walking in somewhere without a mask on. A hundred percent. It's probably yeah. the same way with the two child rule. Exact same. Yeah, exactly. And like what they what they found was like a, a woman knowing that she could only have one child would get that child out and then like get her career underway. And then um, all of a sudden they're like, yeah, now you can have two children. And she's like, but like I'm too old now and I've got I've, like my career's on and I'm not I refuse I'm not doing it wow. so it's like it's they they just refused and then like last year I think it was they increased it to three children now they can have three children and okay. like nobody cares they're done hmm. um when you did your episode how did it play into the episode like how did it play into wow. her story or did it just come up no well uh Chien, the victim, uh, was their one child. Mm -hmm. And um, they were, you know, her parents, to see their one child move from Beijing to Toronto to study. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they have to pay, international students have to pay like four times the amount Mm -hmm. of tuition as domestic students. Oh, yeah. So it's a big investment for the family. But, um, And also, you know, they're expecting that she will one day uh, look after them. Mm -hmm. And then she's she was murdered in Canada seven months after she moved here. So it's seven months later, too. And this it's it it was solved, that crime. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy was actually um, one of those um, weird hanger honorers who like uh, keep hanging out with um, university students when they're not at the university anymore oh, and he those was con- lovely people yeah yeah he's 29 and not attending university but still living in um a rooming house that other international students were in and as it turned out um they found um like half of his porn collection was of the asian like por- porn asian porn okay. that it, i don't know what it is but yeah sure. so it's so it's like he had a he had a thing for Asian women, and that's why he was still hanging around the rooming house close to the university when he wasn't even attending. So he actually lived in the same house as she did. She lived in a three bedroom townhouse with eleven other people, oh. including that guy. Yeah, Nuts. wow, um, that's awful. I'm gonna listen to that one tomorrow because um, that's 
that story is, uh, I, I've, I, when you post it, like her photo uh, on your social media, I recognize it just from like the news reports. When did it happen? Uh, um, 2011. Okay. Yeah. I, me- I just remember seeing like photos and stuff from when that all originally went down, but I certainly don't know the story. So uh, we'll start wrapping this up, but with you, with your show, I know you plan far in advance. You're probably already Not writing. Not really. Your- no. Well, you have to do pretty far in advance because your show is so complicated. What are you What are you working on? You don't have to tell me like what case, but like what's what's coming up? Oh, so I have the case. I'm actually working two cases at the moment. It's funny that you say that. I have um, one case, which is like my next episode, and I, hopefully I'll be recording it either tomorrow or on the weekend. And um, that case is one from BC, and it's a massacre um a, like a mass shooting it's it's actually canada's third largest mass shooting okay and it's a family right i know that yeah. i think i know the story yeah. <laughs> that is a brutal story brutal brutal yeah. and i've been down a rabbit hole with this one too when it comes to um and, um cultural stuff yeah cultural stuff but also um misogyny Plays yeah. A part oh, yeah. In this. yeah. 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 Which in gender or uh, like domestic violence sort of yeah. stuff uh, which is funny uh, with um I, I do lots of coverage of the Nova Scotia mass yeah. shootings and so much of the media coverage is all about domestic violence and gender-based violence and all that, which in that case and what happened in Nova Scotia, there's just not a ton of evidence that that was a big part of the crime. But what you're covering is a mass shooting that clearly that's what's happening. Um, yeah. Brutal, yeah, horrific it, story. Yeah, it, it is. It is. Mm-hmm. Um that that story happened in 1996 so it's mm. quite i should that case happened that tragedy happened in 1996 mm. but behind the scenes i'm also working on another um case which is from toronto and i'm working with it's a it's a case of a, a cyclist who was kind of run down by a car it's it was quite a famous case and it's controversial and i'm working with the father of the victim and he's he's 84 years old Ooh. and he's still yeah I, are you doing it through email and stuff i'm just thinking he's 84 yeah I've, I've i've had a call with him and i you know i told you i hired a producer so i'm working with her as well and um you bring it up every chance you can i can tell <laughs> <laughs> what are you up to christy i'm oh, just dealing with my producer that i hired <laughs> Shush, that's the language. <laughs> she's great. She's uh yeah, she's keeping me on track. But yeah, um it's a it's one of those cases that I have to get it right because there is potential for there's lawyers involved and oh, stuff like wow. that. Okay. Um is it, I'm guessing it's not an intentional uh hitting with the car. Or maybe there's a question about that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. exactly. All right. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I, I, um, oh, listen, if anyone wants to know, I'll say it, whatever. Um, his name was Darcy Allen Shepherd, mm-hmm. and he was a cyclist in Toronto who was, um, the victim of a, like a hit and run. And the person driving the car was, happened to be the, um, a very, a quite prominent man in Ontario politics. Oh, and... okay. I I remember reading something about that. Um, yeah, that'll be interesting. The the especially where you're, you're so close with the family. Like I'm sure you'll get information in your episode that's probably not out there. Yeah. Well, the um, Darcy's father uh, years later went and got uh, a, a freedom of information and got access to like witness testimonies and 911 calls Ooh. and stuff like that. And then he was like, hang on a second. So it's yeah. So I have a, a treasure trove of like audio that I'm going through and and um you know, with my producer. And- <laughs> yeah. yeah. That you crazy. made up to make me yeah. feel bad. <laughs> um, Why? Yeah, no, I'm kidding. Yeah. I'm kidding. Dude, I hired a producer because I, um, cause I can't stay on task. So You're what, like do, a, what a does a producer do? What does a producer do? I, I have no idea. Someone once said to me, um, my, my friend, Scott Philbrook, who has a show called Astonishing Legends. He ever said, if you ever leave, like stop doing your show i would hire you as a producer and i was like thanks man but i have no idea what that would entail 
I didn't tell him that, but. Sorry, like, um, for example, for this little live stream that we have going, you're like technically the producer because you set it all up and you, um, you know, sent me the link. You've done all the technology part. All I had to do was just kind of show up with something to talk about. So you're the producer, buddy. Okay. So if you hire a producer for your show, will they would they like help you pick out cases and handle social media? Like, is that what would happen? Yeah. Well, so you know, I normally I I was hiring researchers and writers, and they do a very specific task, and uh-huh. I did everything else. But the producer Aviva, she's a trained journalist, and um or and an audio producer. So okay. Um because I'm not a journalist, right? And I, I kind of, for this particular story and other stories where I have to work with the families, I think it would be advantageous to have someone who was trained in journalism to work alongside because I don't know what I don't know. And I don't I don't have a journalism degree. I've got a basic marketing degree. And, um, and so she's like, with a case like this that has a lot of like um, audio files and things to sift through, she's mm-hmm. going through all of that. So I'm still writing the script and... Mm-hmm. But where, yeah, there's going to be an interview. And so it's kind of a bit um, more than what I would normally do on an episode. Um, Will it be one episode? It sounds like you're talking about a multi-parter. I don't, honestly, I don't know. It Mm. might be one. It might be a two-parter. I don't know. It's, Mm. I'm flying by the seat of my pants. Mm. Um, But, you know, it's important to me. Yeah, absolutely. so it's been hanging hanging on my shoulders for a while. I just didn't know re- really what to do with it. And then I'm like, eventually I'm like, oh, I can't do this by myself. I have to hire someone to help me. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, that's what I've done. So, um, yeah, she's really great. Awesome. She's really great. So we, she's in Montreal. We have, a, we have a like Zoom call. We talk about what we're doing. Then we go off and do our things and then we meet again. And it's good. It's good for social as well, you know? Wow. Yeah. But does it, do you feel reinvigorated with your show to have some of yes. that stuff taken off? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it really, I, I also really like working with, uh, with a person It will like working alongside someone too. So it's, um, you know, I miss the office. <laughs> yes. It's kind of like you got your own now with your producer. No, that's awesome. It's, it's just like, it's a sign of accomplishment though. Like so few shows like ours that are like, you know, just startups that people make on their laptops. So few get to the point of even having ads, let alone like having advertisements, hiring people, getting researchers. Like it's such a, it happens, uh, like we're so busy that it's hard to like see the forest for the trees, but you've built like uh, something pretty awesome in five years, right? You just celebrated your fifth anniversary. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, thanks. It doesn't I, feel I like five that. years. I, I remember well, you when- you way longer than that. How long are you, seven I th- years? I think, yeah, about seven. But yeah. It's um, and that went by so fast. It's crazy to think, but when like I feel like um, like when I said I've known you for like a year, that's truly how I feel. <laughs> it's like time just like the <laughs> yeah. last the last five years, seven years since I started. It's been such a blur. But the landscape of like podcasts and how this whole thing works, my gosh, like a lot has changed in that period of time. But I was just thinking, you were it was it's been two and a half years since you were at my house. <laughs> <laughs> really okay what's funny that was fun i think i still have to sit no i don't i thought i had the same t-shirt on that i wore that day like because that literally that felt like months ago it's crazy i know um, yeah i know it, do- it does yeah it's like uh covid is like a big freaking time suck isn't it it's yeah like, where has all have all these months gone i well, got nothing to show for there's it there's multiple time sucks happening because covid is is doing it to me I also find my podcast and I, I've ramped up how many episodes I'm doing and that has just like made time fly. Um, but also like I think the one thing that really makes time go fast and serves as a almost like a barometer for time passing is having kids. Like oh, I yeah. see um, you, you can you really get a sense of time passage, uh, the passage of time just by looking at like a photo from one year ago and your kid looks like a baby. Yeah. You, you know, it's like that's what happens to me is I get the Facebook uh, on Facebook. It's like you oh. know, three years ago, you posted a picture and I'm, I'm flipping through Facebook and that pops up and just my eyes fill with tears. I <laughs> it's know. Like it, and it happens every day. Um, I know these, these little people. Uh, yeah. And I'm like, Oh, I wish I could go back and just enjoy it. But 
you're, when you're in the moment, it's a nightmare. It's like, shut up. Get on your iPad and just give <laughs> yeah, me five time minutes. Yeah, for your nap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, let's wrap it up with this. So we'll uh, we'll meet again um, for our scheduled hangout session at the beginning of March. Yeah, and I will report back on Dartmouth Sex Podcast. Um, Any more manscaped kind of feedback you get? Um, yeah, I will. I'll we want to hear about that. I'll be that. sure to tell you about that, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Well, let's wrap it up. Thanks, everybody, for watching and chatting along, and we'll see you soon.